uh, thanks a lot for the invitation and uh, without further ado we'll move forward because this is a very complex topic which i'll uh, explore for the first time here so my question is is it possible to know the epidemiology of antiquity and so i have started exploring the inscription in the, in the temple of uh, epidauros dedicated to the god of medicine uh, asclepius and here we have the source of the material which i have used and i have made a total here of the pathologies that we find in this inscription and here you see the result of that with the number of occurrences in the middle and on the right side the percentage and so you see for example that there the most important pathology is about ophthalmology blindness followed by a female uh, sterility but after that i have pursued and i have explored the entire hippocratic collection uh, here you have the dates of hippocrates and here are the data which we can get on the basis of uh, two of the major uh, Hippocratic works, epidemics and aphorism. And so you see that I have compared them, the two columns in the center of my screen. And I've also compared with the inscriptions of Epidaurus, which we have just seen. And you can see here in this slide that when we take into consideration the Corpus Hippocraticum, the most important pathology is fever, uh, followed not by the digestive system in terms of number, but the respiratory, the number three in my slide here, and then the digestive system. <clears throat> and so what I wanted to do with that is trying to see if we can identify and quantify the pathologies in the ancient world. But as these slides already indicate, there are some uh, discrepancies in the number. And so I explored further the uh, sources that we have at disposal. And the main one is, of course, the text of Dioscorides of Anazarba. My, uh, there is one A which has disappeared, Anazarba. And you see where Anazarba is. And Dioscorides, the uh, most important work that we can use is what is called the Materia Medica, which is in fact in Greece, Perilicia Trichis. And a proper tra translation of that would be on the natural substances to be used to prepare medicine. You have the references of the Greek text and the picture of the volume, and there is an English translation, which is not the best one, but let's say it's useful. And here we have the results of what we can do on Dioscorides. And strangely enough, we have something which is quite different from the works and the inscriptions uh, we have seen so far, with first the skin conditions followed by the gastrointestinal system, and we had that, the gastrointestinal system, and then toxicology, which is something absolutely strange, and then finally, gynecology. And so uh, we continue, I will not read the whole thing. I've already published these numbers, so uh, these are accessible. And so here, if we compare again, the uh, three groups of material, which I have checked, we here you see the result and this is uh, a little bit disturbing because we cannot get a final picture and so i have explored the question of the diagnosis and as fabrizio mentioned indeed i have been following in the footstep of the historian of medicine Mirko meg and here his major works on the topic with the book on the left and the english translation in the center and uh, I came up with the idea that it should be possible to take the manuals of therapeutics as a mirror image of the pathological reality. And I came up with the idea that we should be able to go from the therapist to the pathology. And uh, I was using the concept of regressive, but regressive in all languages means something slightly different, some, somebody or something which doesn't make any progress. And so I came to the notion of reverse diagnosis, which is a term in logic, when you have a reasoning in which you have the conclusion, but not the premises, reverse thinking consists in going back from the conclusion to the premises in the syllogism. 
And very recently, I found this term, this expression used here in this article in that book. And here you have the explanation by Elizabeth Xu about reverse diagnosis. But uh, here in this article, the expression is used in a almost banal way. A physician, a GP in a consultation, in the anamnesis of the patient, ask the patient what medicine he or she takes. And from that, he tries to guess what is the medical condition of the patient. I want to formalize it in a very, a stricter way, uh, more formal. I want to elevate this concept of reverse diagnosis as the heuristic method epistemological instrument to go from uh, therapies to pathology. So I want to use it in a much stricter, much more formal, much more productive way. And so the conditio sine qua non to do that is that we can identify the medical condition and the plants. Medical condition, which is exactly the problem we are working on. Uh, we have paleopathology, which has been around for quite some time. And so you'll see here from uh, some of the books in the field, there is even an international journal of paleopathology. And uh, sometimes we have surprising results uh, it has been claimed that syphilis was already present in metaponto, and so we have the dates here of metaponto. But let's say that this uh, statement has raised quite a polemic, which is still open. And so paleopathology, productive, but with a limitation. And one of the most important limitations is about the infectious diseases. And so here you have these images of a job in, in, in the Bible, and we don't know what was the disease of a job. Uh, anthrax, uh, sk another skin disease, plague, pharyngitis, or whatever, we don't know. But it seemed that infectious disease were impossible to catch until, uh, or also because the idea now is that pathogens evolve extremely rapidly. And so you'll see here an article very recent, September 23rd, 2021, so not even one week. Uh, there is already resistance, drug resistance, uh, to artemisinin in Africa. So, which means that the pathogens evolve very rapidly. And so this gave the impression that it's impossible to catch the ancient pathogens. However, DNA research, ancient DNA research has made it possible to identify the agent of uh, lepra in the past. And so it seems indeed that it is possible to catch ancient pathogens through DNA analysis. And how about the plants? Are there genetic modifications of the plants from antiquity to now that makes it impossible, once again, to identify the plants? And uh, let's say we have made some research about that, and we have been able to identify plants in an ancient medicine dating back to 140, 120 uh, BC. So it seems possible. And very recently, two articles have shown that the plants evolve less rapidly than we think. They have developed mechanism to slow down the uh, genetic evolution. So it seems possible to identify the plants. And so on this basis, what we have done is trying to find in the literature all the possible identification which have been proposed after the creation of the linear system of the plants mentioned in the ancient text. And so you'll see that we have uh, databased that. And uh, you have, uh, apart from the column on the extreme left, the uh, automatic numbering, you have the Greek names, which are written in Latin alphabet, but it doesn't matter. And then you see DSC, THP, HPC, uh, DSC for Dioscorides, THP for Theophrast, HPC for the Hippocratic Collection, and then you have the source of the identification and the uh, column in uh, yellow at the very uh, top with the identification as per the linear system. We have also made some of the representation of the plants in the manuscripts. A Greek manuscript, and so you see in the middle the identification of the manuscript, and then on the right the folios, and so you see one of these images. And so, on the basis of all this material, we believe that we can make some plausible identification of.
the plants. And so we were uh, prepared and we uh, were wondering how shall we proceed? Shall we go by plants one by one? And so you see here some of the typical plants of the Mediterranean environment, which indeed we find in the text. And uh, here, one of them is a very significant iris, the first one in Dioscorides de Materia Medica. And we have a whole range of plants that we could analy an analyze, be the uh, medicinal, properly medicinal or alimentary plants, because there is a total confusion of medicine and alimentary plants. But it didn't seem us to be the right way to go. Because what we wanted to do is being much more comprehensive, not working on just one plant, one chapter, one application, but we wanted to study the whole material from the sources. And so here you have the uh, 10 volumes of the Hippocratic collection in the literary edition, and we have manually digitized all the text and on that basis here, we have extracted all the mentions of the plants, which you will see in the column in the left, and then the title of the treatise with the reference, then the column in the center reference uh, in French, uh, reference to Littre, and then a resume of the prescription. This is in French, not only because I was a native French speaker, but because the French, the edition of uh, Littre is in French, so we use French as the basis. We have also worked on uh, Dioscorides, you see it again here, the data. I have digitized the full text of Dioscorides manually, so we have it in a, a computer version, and on that basis we have generated a word index of Dioscorides, which means that we can find any term that we want in the whole text of Dioscorides. 1,000 pages, it's something uh, quite significant. And uh, this database makes it possible, as you can see here in the slide, to find any plant with the references uh, in the center and the pathologies which these plants are supposed to treat. And so you will see here that we have used the Greek text uh, written in Latin alphabet. So that the material that we have created and uh, collected and on which we work. And so now, how do we use that? We have merged all the databases that we have created. And so you'll see here the third column from the left. We have CHP for Corpus Hippocraticum. If you go down, you'll see DSC for Dioscorides. And at the very bottom, we have also Galen, because we have made exactly the same thing on Galen. An important fact is that in all our databases, we have always the exact reference of the occurrences we are working with. And so you see, for example, the very first line at the top, 7.424.19, which means that this mention appears in volume seven of the literary edition, page 424, line 19. All our information is always verifiable. You can always double check what we do and what we uh, say. And so here we are, once we have uh, worked on all the material on the basis of the databases, as we see. And one of the terms which uh, seem to be a good uh, case study is .en. You'll find in the literature that this is a small abscess, a bow, a furuncle, and we have an exact description in uh, Aristotle, part of animals. We have it also in the Anonymous Londinensis. And so here the translation, a phlegmas that provoke dotien and swelling and a fluxus of humor resulting from an excess of humor. So this is indeed a physiopathological explanation, but we don't know exactly what that is because this is quite conceptual. Uh, fluxes of humor, excess of humor, okay, but what exactly? We have some sort of definition and description in uh, Galen on the tumors uh, non-natural, the tumoribus praeter naturam, 15. It doesn't appear, the dotien doesn't appear in the pseudo-Galenic definitionis medicae, so we don't have a description, but it, the text of Galen on uh, tumor 
non-natural tumor has been taken by Oribasius in the synopsis, and so you have the reference book 7, chapter 31, and uh, from Oribasius, who have it in uh, Paul of Hyena, uh, 7th century, book 4, chapter 23. So my question is, we have a description in conceptual terms of uh, swelling, of uh, humors, an excess of humor, but we don't know exactly what that is and what is the uh, process. And so what we have done is taking the uh, therapeutic agents. And so in Dioscorides de Materia Medica, we have 11 occurrences of uh, Dotien, and we don't have three, but four major groups, sorry for the mistake. We have sugary substances, fix, Desiccative substances, uh, natron, so a mineral substance, wood cleaning and emollient uh, substances, so, which I mean here, substances which, according to Dioscorides, were used to clean wounds and uh, have an emollient accent, and we have also an analgesic substance. What information does that give to us? The sugary substances are some sort of natural antibiotic desiccative to stop suppuration and emission of uh, liquid substances, wound cleaning, that's absolutely evident, and emollient because the whole surface is becoming hard and uh, difficult to treat, and of course, analgesic. So what we have here is a set of substances that defines exactly the properties described in a certain sense by reverse reasoning, again, what a dotien is. And so it seems that the approach that we are trying to take might work. And then we continue on a substance and we took myrrh. And why myrrh? Because this is the substance with the highest number of occurrences in the Hippocratic collection. And so you see here, I've taken a screenshot of the database, and you'll see at the very bottom on the left that we have indeed 137 occurrences of it. And here I have uh, taken uh, one part of it, and you'll see that we have only applications for the uh, female pathologies, including the very famous hysteria, which I will not discuss now. Uh, here also, we have in the database, which I haven't shown uh, before, in the center, the Galenic form, the way the substances were used. And so what is significant here is that, uh, no, the interpretation, uh, interpretation of the use of Mir might be that it was an expensive uh, costly substance. And this has been used to argue that this was to spice up the recipes, to give prestige to the re recipes by using something rare, costly, which adds to the uh, aura of uh, prestige, let's say, to the recipes. But if we look more carefully at these 137 uses, we see that 69 uh, general uses in gynecology, six in postpartum, and 12 to treat female infertility. And of course, in the text, this is not called female inf infertility, but it is written to increase the probability or possibility to become pregnant for a woman. In all these cases, this was in a direct application on the cervix, or in fumigation. And there are also some ophthalmological uses and wound cleaning uh, uses. So what is uh, clear is that myrrh was the gynecological substance by excellence. It was applied directly on the cervix or by fumigation, which was a very typical uh, way of doing. And it was clearly to avoid infections of the cervix. And myrrh is indeed a bactericide uh, property. And so we can imagine that it was used to treat any possible infection of the uh, cervix and the wall. And this might explain 
both the genericale uses, the postpartum uses, because there are so many women who died of postpartum infection, and also the female infertility. There might have been infections of the cervix, which prevented, prohibited fecundation. And so this might have been a barrier which didn't allow the uh, sperm to get into and to arrive to a conception. What we have by way of consequence is a very dramatic image of the possible conditions of women in antiquity. But this is something else. I will not uh, further explore that, but that's a point that we have to bear in uh, mind when considering the uh, pathology of the ancient uh, world. I go now with uh, Elibor, which is the second most quoted uh, substance in the corpus hippocalaticum, and you'll see that we have 97 occurrences. And so here, once again, uh, my database is uh, in French. You remember, I made it on the basis of uh, literary edition. And we see that Elibor is used in a great many different uh, conditions, which seem to have nothing to do with each other. So uh, we have uh, pleurisy uh, in the first line, uh, female infertility, second line, uh, you have uh, female pathology, gynecological pathologies, madness, uh, leukorrhea, uh, respiratory um, diseases, excess of uh, alimentation, we have everything. And so the question is, why do we have all that uh, elbow? And so we need to remember that elbow is a strong cathartic. And we find indeed that there was quite a high level of parasitic infection of the digestive system in antiquity. And so we can hypothesize that elbow was administered to clean the organism of all the possible worms infesting the digital, the digestive, sorry, digestive system before the administration of any medicine. It was some sort of preparation of the field before administering a medicine. And we have another uh, uh, proof of this presence of uh, intestinal worms in a very famous text of the Hippocratic collection, a young man who was drunk in the field, he was sleeping with his uh, open mouth, and so uh, he had a snake which entered his mouth. But here, there is probably a legend, let's say, with a folkloric legend which developed, the snake probably didn't enter the mouth, but get out of the digestive system of this uh, young man. And uh, here, according to the Hippocratic tale, uh, he died. But uh, I don't believe that it might have been the case. What I am saying is that this is a text which, in a certain way, might be a sign of this uh, strong presence of intestinal worms in the digestive system. And interestingly enough, this Hippocratic tale has been uh, reuse, recycled, if I may, in the legends of Cosmas and Damianos, the uh, holy healer uh, who uh, treated the man who had indeed a snake in his uh, digestive system. But uh, returning to my question, this strong use of elebor might be a sign of all these uh, parasitic uh, infections and a use as a preliminary phase of a treatment to clean the organism of possible parasite before administering a medicine. Then we have tried something else, malaria. Uh, this is of which we know it was uh, endemic in the ancient world. And logically, what we look for in the ancient treatises is the uh, treatments for tertian and quartan fever. 
And here you have the results in the hippocratic collection on the left and Dioscorides on the right. And so you'll see that in the hippocratic collection, if we distinguish by uh, ways of fusing the plants, we have one uh, use which is not uh, specified, a millet, and then uh, portions. And so we have uh, three uh, substances for tertian fever, the same for quartan fever, three substances. Uh, on the right, Dioscorides, we have a little bit more, but nothing really significant. And in any case, we don't have a number of agents that might correspond to the endemic nature of the pathology. So there is something that doesn't work here, just looking at torsion and quartan fever. And so we came with the idea that we need to find another symptom uh, of uh, malaria, which is indeed the swelling, the spleen. Uh, we needed to find this other symptom to catch malaria in the ancient text. And if we take the swelling of the spleen, we have 25, 26 uh, clinical descriptions in the Hippocratic collection and 76 occurrences in Dioscrides and Materia Medica, which seems to be much more logical and uh, understandable. And if we look at the agents in Dioscrides, here they are. And the uh, order in English uh, might seem to be incoherent, but in fact, it has been made on the basis of the Greek names, alphabetical order of the Greek names in the text of Dioscorides. And so you see you've all with the references to the text of Dioscorides. So Maiden Hair, book four, chapter 134, Agaric, book three, chapter one, etc., etc. The question is, were these swellings of the spleen all related to malaria? Because there might be other conditions which might have provoked the swelling of the spleen. And so here we have to check the agents, the uh, therapeutic agents that were used. And surprisingly enough, we don't find Artemisia, which is the plant from which Artemisia is the uh, genus. Uh, from which artemisinin has been developed. But this might be under, understandable in the ancient text because artemisia is the gynecological plant by excellence. Uh, already its name indicates that it was uh, for uh, gynecology. However, there is one species uh, of the uh, genus and the other plants are insect repellents, insecticides, and antiparasitic. So it seems that some of the agents which were used to treat the swelling of the spleen might refer to malaria. And it seems that the result, the selection result from a very clear idea of the pathological process because there is this insect insecticide and antiparasitic. So it seems that there is indeed the idea that malaria was caused by the uh, mosquito and uh, that the agents were selected on the basis of this uh, knowledge and the presence of the parasite within the organism of the uh, patient. And so there is an apparent polypharmacy which is not the last recourse, which is not the technique of substitution. If you don't have this one, use that one. So there are many agents, but they have complementary uh, properties and action. And so it's a multi-spectral spectral, uh, therapeutic strategy rather than uh, ignorance or empirical or something that was the last recourse. Let's try everything we have in order to try and get at least something that worked. Another interesting uh, pathology is uh, gout, Podagra, of which we have 48 occurrences in Dioscorides. And strangely enough, we don't have Colchicum, Colchicin, which is the remedy by our excellence of gout. Even modern therapeutic agents are based on Colchicin. However, the fact is that Colchicon, uh, there is a lambda which is missing, Colchicon in Dioscrides book four, chapter 84, is highly toxic, uh, considered to be, it is uh, considered to be highly toxic. And it was often confused in antiquity and even nowadays with onions and uh, saffron. And uh, we have 
Nevertheless, in Diorque Bolbos Edimos, which is here, uh, book 2170, the Muscari Comosim, Comosim, which you see here, which was confused with Colchicon. So there is some sort of here indetermination because there were confusion. And so we see the presence in the back of the picture of Colchicin, even though the plant itself is not properly recommended and used. So it might be the case that it was used even though it was toxic. And so here, it, uh, the problem was to avoid the confusion and the toxic action, but it seems that it was present. And again, this is something which is uh, very well known, very well uh, analyzed in the ancient medicine and indicates that there is a good knowledge of the action of the plant and consequently of the action of the uh, pathology. Continuing, depression of very modern uh, disease, which we don't have. I am often asked uh, if there is Alzheimer, depression, or these kind of uh, pathologies, modern pathologies in the ancient text, and say, no, we cannot catch them because they were not conceptualized. The nosology Ancient nosology is very different, and so the nosography is very different, and so it's difficult. And so here we have a plant in Dioscides, uh, Book 4, Chapter 73. I have uh, the Greek text and the translation. Uh, head, so description of the plant. There is a head, which is in fact a fruit, which is like an olive. Uh, thorny of the catkin fruit of the plane tree, something like that. And further on, a fruit in cluster, round black, just like a uh, grape. That doesn't work. It's impossible to have a plant which has all that. And so when we look carefully at the text, we see indeed description of something like the plane tree, yeah? And then description of the black fruit like the grape. But when we analyze carefully the text, we see that two things have been confused. On the left, we have indeed Datura, and on the right, we have a Solanesi, Solanum Nigrum, probably. And the text, indeed, there has been an accident at some point in time of the transmission of the text, and two chapters, which were different, but which follow each other, have been merged in one and a single uh, chapter in Dioscorides text. What is interesting here is that this description corresponds exactly to Datura, and Datura is believed to be a plant of the new world and not of the old world, but that's something I will not uh, continue on, but uh, this means that we have to revise the description, this distribution of the plant between new and old world. And so returning to the plant and considering that this might be a Solanesi, here is the text of Dioscorides, taking a quantity of one drug with wine, root as a property of provoking not unpleasant fantasies, which is a very elegant to say that it is a psychotropic plant. And then we have the uh, toxic effects. And so I believe that this plant was used as an antidepressant. If you are depressed, you don't have these kind of fantasies. You see only negative uh, images uh, in your life, uh, uh, lack of um, a good mood of energy and so you see here you have this plant which might uh, help you to go over a state of depression and some uh, ophthalmologic pathologies with amblyopia in dioscolis 24 occurrences Various solanaceae, which include Atropa belladona which is known for its midriatic effect pupillary dilatation as in lower light. And so Belladonna, we all know the story of the Venetian ladies who were using that to have uh, these wonderful eyes, uh, instrument of seduction, we know all that. And we have this uh, expression in Dioscorides also, the shades on the pupils. Uh, we don't know exactly what that is, 24 occurrences. Is that a glaucoma? The term glaucoma is not attested in Dioscorides, but in any case, the glaucoma in modern medicine is a term for several pathogenic processes characterized by an increase of intraocular 
uh, pressure. And so when we go back to Dioscurides, we see that most of the substances used to treat the episcotunta dioscurides are credited with a warming property, which in Dioscurides and in ancient medicine, warming provokes a relaxation of uh, all the vessels in the body, which consequently reduce the pressure, which might indeed be the right agent to treat the glaucoma, which is characterized by the increase of uh, pressure. And to conclude this very brief, uh, rapid uh, overview, which aims to render the idea drunkenness which among students and in university is something uh, very uh, real. Uh, counteracting drunkenness acrypalos in Dioscorides, two occurrences, one procusativo, the other one Artemisia absintium, which are uh, tonic, and the other one preventing drunkenness. And so you have the Greek expression, we have one occurrence in Dioscorides, all months. And uh, in the ancient text, Dioscorides, uh, nuts, like a walnut, for example, are considered to be difficult to digest, but for the stomach, produced by provoke vomiting and counteract poisons when taken preventively. What is the point? The point is that they cover the stomach's internal wall, the surface, and they prevent the absorption of toxins and so, of course, also as alcohol and prevent their penetration into the blood system. And this reminds me the good old student trick to drink the oil of uh, sardines before going to a party. Absolutely disgusting, but this cover the internal surface of the stomach and prevents the absorption of uh, alcohol through the system. So uh, let's try to conclude with a huge uh, range of plants in Dioscorides and also in the Corpus Hippocraticum, multiple uses, which are not random, as I have tried to suggest here. And the analysis on all the uses of these substances, and not just one of them, for each substance, the analysis of all the cases hints at uses that correspond to an exact knowledge of the pathology for the treatment of which the substance were used. And so I do believe that it is possible to use the therapeutic indications of the substances to have a high definition knowledge and idea of the pathologies for the treatment of which these substances were used. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be uh, glad to answer any question, comment that the audience will want to make.